Thank you. Uh, I want to add my welcome um, as well and also extend a welcome to those of you who may be joining us later online or through the Cable Access TV and thanks to the folks um, who are helping out recording this. Uh, one little point on the, uh, the questions uh, or I, I would ask that, that you not actually shout out and interrupt a speaker in the middle of them speaking, uh, but if you do have a question, please just put a hand up um, and we'll try and work those in. Um, my, most of my experience relates to teaching teenagers, um, and teenagers can, as many of you know, at times be a boisterous group. Uh, so I do have some experience with um, <laughs> boisterous groups and sometimes lively and challenging conversation. Uh, so hopefully we'll get some lively and challenging conversation today. Uh, so I'd like to start out by just, we'll go in this direction here and ask each of the panelists to briefly introduce themselves. Um, and if you'd like to you know, share your name a little bit on your training um, and you know, if there's a, you know, one or two significant books or articles you've written or some current projects that you'd like to mention, uh, just so that we get a sense of who's here. Sure, thanks Tim. My name's Mary Fuhrer. I'm a public historian. My training, my PhD is in um, American history up to the Civil War, focusing on the early Republic and the transition from colonial to new nation history on uh, the New England level. And I work with um, public institutions such as historical societies, Mass Foundation for the Humanities, um, Old Sturbridge Village, large museums and historical organizations, and my most recent book recovers the story of the tumult in small town village New England in the early Republic. Um, I'm Tona Hangen. I'm the department chair of history and political science at Worcester State. Um, I have a degree in anthropology from MIT and a doctorate in history from Brandeis. And I've written about, I'm, I'm interested in the intersection of media, religion, and culture. So I have a book um, about 15 years ago now, a revision of my dissertation about radio preachers um, from the sort of radio evangelism and its importance to the nation's political and cultural identity. Um, I'm currently working very, very slowly on a new book project about the era of massive resistance to school integration um, starting in Virginia in the places where schools were closed rather than integrated. Um, and so as I began that project a few years ago, it seems ever more timely, both in my classroom and in our wider community. So I'm feeling like you pick anything you want to deal with in history, and there's something in our own time that it speaks to. So um, anyway, and I teach a lot, so that's my other, that's what I do mostly. So my name is Kevin Levin, and I moved to Boston in 2011 uh, from Virginia, from Charlottesville, where I lived and taught uh, American history for 11 years uh, on the private school level. Um, I write mainly about the American Civil War and specifically about the memory, memory of the war. So I'm very interested in how Americans have remembered and quite often forgotten certain aspects of the war and how that evolves over time. I wrote one book that came out in 2012. I'm finishing my second, uh, probably in another four weeks. And in addition to writing, I also, well, I also blog. Uh, I've been blogging since 2005 at Civil War Memory. And when I had the time, I also write for a bunch of other publications. So right now, just uh, writing full time. Um, I'm Megan Kate Nelson. I live in Lincoln. Um, and I was an academic for 12 years and then a couple of years ago left um, academia in order to uh, try and make it as a full-time writer. Um, and I'm happy to report <laughs> that has been mostly successful. Um, and so my, my first two books, the first was about the Okefenokee Swamp in southern Georgia, which if you know Pogo, you probably know the Okefenokee. Um, and my second book was about destruction in the Civil War of all different kinds, um, the, the ruination of buildings and um, bodies and forests. Um, so it was a super happy book. And um, the book I'm currently working on um, is a narrative history of the Civil War in the desert southwest, which is a theater of the war. Yes, see, this is the reaction I usually get, like, what? Um, 
because no one really knows um, anything that happened in that region. Um, so that's great for me, um, and I'm sure we'll all be talking about this also. Kind of how do you how do you know when you've hit a good topic? And one of those uh, ways that you know is that no one's really talked about it before, or you get that sort of reaction of surprise because then people really want to know about it. Um, so that that book will be. Um, I'm actually just about to finish part two of three. Um, this weekend and um, and uh, should be published by Scribner in 2019. Well, I'm Rick Wigan and I've been introduced as the Revolutionary War guy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I have um, I have no uh, training in history or writing. I sort of come about this from the back door. I'm trained as a business person, um, but I've been involved in what I call uh, experiential, somewhat euphemistically experiential history or reenacting uh, living history uh, for a number of years, and that's my entree to, the, to this uh, whole process. Uh, and that led me to getting into a lot of, of research for very esoteric stuff, uh, which I ended up publishing little blips here and there to verify or to refute some of the uh, information that gets passed around uh, in living history circles. Uh, and then I found a few years ago that I had a briefcase full of data that was going to disappear because my research project was done. This is the product of about five or six years of research. Uh, and I decided that wasn't such a great idea. So I approached the Historical Society, uh, who decided that they would love to have this information published. Uh, and it resulted in Embattled Farmers, which is the first, uh, turns out, it's, it's, it's the it's the chronicle of the war through the experiences of 256 uh, residents of a single community. Yes. Happens to be Lincoln, Mass. Uh, but it's representative, and it's a surrogate for virtually every community in New England. Uh, and uh, I've been very pleased that it's, it's um, for, a, for a book that I expected to have a, a circulation of about 25, uh, it's one <laughs> It's won some awards and has done very well, so I'm very pleased with that. Uh, and then uh, I've gotten involved more recently in a project, uh, which is a Civil War biography uh, of a largely unknown Civil War General Thomas Welsh from uh, Columbia, Pennsylvania. And hopefully that will come to fruition in another year or so. I'm Ursula Wong, and I am not a PhD. I am not an academic. I have never taught outside of a business scenario. So um, kind of, I guess, uh, appropriately at the very end of the table, um, I have degrees in physics and mathematics. I spent my career designing um, identity systems, security systems, email systems, and file systems in the financial services sector. So. Um, I came at history when um, I retired and decided to write fiction. And the history angle came about when I found among my uncle's manuscripts, after he, after he deceased my uncle's papers, a manuscript that talked about the invasion of the Soviet army in Eastern Europe during World War II. <coughs> and this event spurred years of study and investigation and interviews ultimately culminating in a uh, book called Amber Wolf. And this is about uh, a young woman who is uh, cast into uh, the tail end of the Civil War in a country that has to decide whether they are going to side with the Nazis, side with the Soviets, or just go away and hide during this uh, tremendously difficult scenario for them. So this young woman has to decide whether she's going to stay and fight for her freedom against this massive Soviet army, joining essentially farmers who traded their pitchforks for stolen weapons to fight Stalin's million man army. So this is the truth of it. The manuscript kind of got me interested in that subject and I, I think it's a very engaging subject. And the result is Amber Wolf. And I'm subsequently working on the second in that series, a book called Amber War, I guess the Amber series, or <laughs> however we want to call it. But Amber War is about um, the resistance fighters who ultimately realize that they're on their own. And the West isn't going to help them. And they make personal decisions about whether they're going to fight the Soviets or try to you know, go on and have some semblance of a normal life as a person in an occupied country. So 
that's Amber War, Amber War, and stay tuned. Hopefully, it'll be out this year. All right. Thank. I want to thank each of uh, the panelists for their introductions. As I was listening uh, to you folks, I was just jotting down a couple sort of thoughts in terms of the, trying to bring together some of what you've mentioned, um, and it, it struck me that that you folks are writing about sort of how do, how do countries or communities face change? Uh, you're writing about race, you're writing about history, you're writing about memory of those events. Um, there was some discussion about formal versus informal training uh, for historians or how we get to the point where we end up sort of producing the writing we're producing. Um, there's also this sense of particular or local history versus national stories. And, and to what extent, at least with the work of two of you, um, does do those local stories reflect regional or national stories? And, and can those local stories help us to understand national stories in, in other ways? Um, and I was also struck by ways in which our own personal narratives or, or family stories and archives uh, can create openings for, for the work uh, that we end up doing. I know with some of the, the things I've been working on, um, sometimes it's, it's something as simple as you know, finding a box in my grandparents' attic, uh, and there's this incredible treasure in there, and the treasure can become the basis uh, for a much larger story because it opens this window into all of these these different ideas. Uh, so even within the introductions, there's all of these ideas about, about history and training and, and what this is all for uh, that have been raised. Um, so I, I have a whole bunch of questions. The panelists have seen the questions before, um, and we're not necessarily going to be going through them in a list, but i just like to start out with um, this question of sort of what you do as a historian or as a writer, how would you define history? Um, is there a difference between history and the past? Um, and, and then, you know, as you approach these sort of, you know, are you writing nonfiction history? Are you writing historical fiction? What's the interrelationship? Uh, and I know there's an enormous amount of questions in there, and I don't know who'd like to get us started. But, but just as we're thinking about these ideas, I mean, what, what is this history that you're, that you're writing about? So I don't know if someone would like to get started. But. Sure, I'll, I'll jump off. Um, so most of you may be aware that about 30 years ago, historians had a sort of uh, identity crisis when they began to tackle with the fact that facts are not necessarily true. <laughs> like the, maybe the origin of the al first alternative fact issue. Um, and began to redefine the past as not something that we can definitively know, but something upon which we impose our current day um, understanding. So the past is sort of like a, a canvas on which we paint as historians. And we've struggled with that back and forth. Is the past, how much is the past knowable? Is it true? Whatever. Uh, I'd like to think that history is a story. It's not merely a chronicle of events, it's a story. And that story is hopefully shaped by the evidence, but inevitably as well shaped by our own personalities and personal experiences. So the story that we tell from the same evidence can change even over the course of our lifetime. I'm sure if I had to rewrite um, the book that I wrote, um, it, the story now with the experiences I've had in the last 10 years would be somewhat different. So it's a, it is a, to my mind, it is a story based on evidence. Um, but it, that's a big question, so I'm sure <laughs> others have. Um, if I may jump in on that, um, it's, it has long bothered me. My, my whole um, approach has been to try to distinguish fact from, from myth or supposition. Uh, and 
Um, and I agree, uh, Mary, completely that that history gets rewritten by every by every generation. You know, it used to be said that history is is written by the winners, but it's not. It's written by each successive generation. It's rewritten. Um, it breaks down, however, I think, where where the facts. Uh, where, where the rewriting becomes revisionist history and the facts become clouded uh, for a particular purpose. And if I can just briefly use, uh, and I hope I don't offend anybody, but the Battle of Lexington as an example. Um, there was no such thing as a Battle of Lexington. That was a creation that, that occurred by revision, re revising history. It's traceable from 1824 to the centennial in, in 1875. Uh, and they created, uh, for local pride purposes, they created a Battle of Lexington to, to counteract the power of the Battle of Concord. And, and it's, it's, it's traceable through the historio historiography of the time. Um, it's a fascinating process, but now everybody believes there was this pitched battle on the Lexington Green, and it never was. There was simply a, there were, there were, there were deaths in the, in the Lexington Green, but it was a massacre. It was a very one-sided, there was no return, virtually no return fire, and there was no, no pitch battle at all. Um, so it's an interesting dynamic that, that we face as, as historians. I, I do historical fiction. So um, one thing that I agonize over is uh, creating a balance. So obviously the facts of history are important. There are, there are facts, there are dates when things happen. Uh, maybe as per uh, Mary's comments, uh, things can be interpreted. But one thing I worry about tremendously, especially in the World War II story, the Soviet story of World War II and the Eastern European counterbalance, is how did people do what they did and um, some of it was very bad, and some of it was very good and very noble. But I think it was all a balance. And I sleep at night because I make up characters. <laughs> and I have my characters live the history. And by doing this, I can make a Soviet officer a humanitarian. I know there were Soviet humanitarians. I can make uh, a native Lithuanian partisan fighter a brutal person. And by statistics, I know some of the activity was brutal. So in making this up, I think I can tell truth. And balance is a very difficult thing. And you know, maybe we do distort history a little bit. But I think that one thing we can get to with the fictional part of historical fiction is raising awareness as to what happens so that we can apply it to what might happen. Yeah, I think um, this is an interesting kind of distinction between kind of facts and narrative. Um, <clears throat> but even when you look at, I mean, if we just were to make a, a chronological list of dates where important things happened, um, that's still shaping, right? You're still putting it in a narrative that makes sense to us. Um, and, and this is one of the, I mean, when I was teaching, this was a really hard thing for students to kind of get a hand along because they're like, wait, no, what? Um, and it's a little easier actually to talk to them about it now with the world of social media, right? I'm like, well, when you post on social media, are you giving the facts? Even, even if you say like, this is what I did today, you're still, you're choosing to represent that, you're choosing your words, you're, you're maybe posting a photo, you know, you're doing all of these things that, that shape these events, um, you know, with your own voice. And so any evidence that we deal with has this element of it, right? And, and so for the work that we do, we just have to consider what, what is all this evidence? What are all these narratives that people are, are creating um, in the moment or after the fact? Um, and can we build an understanding of what happened and how people experienced it using all of those pieces of evidence together. Um, so that's not so much about, you know, am I conveying something that is true, that is factual, but am I creating a better understanding of what happened or what people believed happened? I mean, I know Ke yeah, Kevin studies Civil War memory, which is one of the most <laughs> complicated and convoluted um, kind of um, creation of many, many narratives um, in this respect. So you yeah, no, it, It's interesting because I think you can also approach your question in terms of what people want to get out of 
their engagement with history. So certainly you can look at it through sort of the lens of the academic who spends time in the archives and tries to sort of piece together an interpretation that um, that is as honest as possible to the available evidence um, and that sort of adds to the, the knowledge, the historiography. And then, you know, you meet people in public who are living historians or connect with, especially in the case of the Civil War, through an ancestor. And so that's a whole other set of emotions and sort of thinking that goes on in terms of how they're engaging the past and what it means to them. And then think of something along the lines of our current debate about Confederate monuments and sort of how the ways in which people are rallying around these sites for and against and the meaning they attach to these to these relics of the past. And, you know, so what is history? What is narrative of history? And what is memory? And what is objective and personal? I mean, all of these things get really fuzzy and... And from my perspective, that's when things get really interesting and trying to just sort of wade your way through it, um, which is extremely difficult and sometimes, I think, futile. But you do your best. Mm -hmm. um, just, to, uh, just to maybe not pull things together, but I, I think this um, is the first question to ask, really. Like, what, what is this? And, and for my own students, I lay it out carefully at the beginning of each class. History is not the past. There, we, there is a past. <laughs> there was a past. Um, none of us live there anymore. Um, and there's evidence from it. And that's all we have of, of the past. And so every time we even make that list or begin to impose our significance upon that evidence from the past, then we're doing history. And um, so that history is a constant argument about the past. But this is a, that, so that's the kind of sophisticated academic view of it. That's not what most people come into the classroom with, or most people have in, kind of in the general public. Um, a couple of uh, semesters ago, I came across a law that was passed in Florida, passed, by the way, not just proposed, but passed in Florida in 2006, signed by Jeb Bush. And it begins like this, American history was an education bill. American history shall be viewed as factual, not constructed, shall be viewed as knowable, teachable, and testable, and shall be viewed as the creation of a new nation based largely upon the universal principles stated in the Declaration of Independence. I, I can kind of get behind this, the second and third parts of that. I mean, okay. But the first part of it, I can't get behind. American history shall be viewed as factual, not constructed. That is precisely not what I'm doing in my classroom. I'm trying to always to, to say that history is constructed and it's built in the living and the experience, yeah. right? In the reenacting, it's built in the creation of characters that are plausible, but maybe not, you know, didn't actually exist. And it's created as we try to shape our own stories about the past and as we keep arguing about them. Uh, Richard, were you formulating a response to that? Well, or? I sort of was, and, and but I'm not sure that, that we need to have a debate among ourselves here about about, <laughs> about what can, what constitutes uh, factual versus constructed. I mean, I think that's a very interesting interesting issue. But um, but I think as historians, David Hackett Fisher told me years ago that that as historians we we try to uh, to figure out exactly what happened. And uh, at least this was his perspective on it, and, and, and that that his in his research he was trying to dig out everything that he could possibly find to be able to describe. This was in conjunction with his his uh, landmark book, uh, Paul Revere's Ride, um, in which um, uh, he was there. Were, there were a number of of, of um, criticisms about it, and he was defending uh, how. With all the evidence, you sort of drill down to with the sort of the premise, at least as a historian, that you can figure out exactly what happened, uh, and so it is. It has to be uh, factually based, um, but yes, it, it. I mean, it does get reconstructed. I mean, you you have to reconstruct the facts. Uh, no two people on any battlefield ever have the same experience, for example. So. So which one is which the one fact? is it? Which one is the fact? Sure, right. sure. Or are they both, or all. Oh, <laughs> considered, yeah. yeah. Well, um, I was wondering if the panelists, and I, I think Richard and Clarissa, who kind of are the dynamic opposites, 
Um, I was wondering if you could just talk about endnotes, footnotes, and getting from your sources as you see them to the words you put on the page and the process that goes in because other than copying everything from your primary or secondary sources and saying this is a primary source, this is a secondary source, this is why I think it may be right, it may be wrong, and doing all that and writing a, a very, maybe, dull narrative. <laughs> How do you get along that <clears throat> continuum to make it a narrative, to make it a story you're interpreting, but you do you have to say how much you're interpreting the words, what you're leaving out, what you're leaving in, and ultimately you get to the place where Ursula is. And so the other question is, I'm sorry if it sounds, no, historical fiction is great stuff, but what do you have to do to say, this is actually a true thing, and all of this other stuff was made up? And how do you balance that? That's a very difficult thing to do. And most people who write historical fiction don't do it because it, it would ruin the story. So I'm very interested in how you all think about that and whether you have 2,000 footnotes to your book or just what's essential. It's well, a good I, question, I guess. I would <laughs> say that I've had a lifelong um, envy of the freedom and poetic license available to those who write historical fiction. Uh, how many times? <laughs> how many times I would love to be able to say he trudged wearily to the top of the hill. Well, I have no evidence that he was weary or that he trudged. You know what? I, I, I can't say that, and I have to be able to document what I have. So I envy that. Um, I think it it can be done. Um, it can be done beautifully through very minute details such as the weather or any anyone who's read The Midwife's Tale um, by Laurel Ulrich Thatcher knows that she absorbs that, she has totally immersed herself in that location and time and feeling and so is able to add those sorts of details that really bring a story alive. But um, it's, I would think, it's, it's very tough, and it's a challenge, and it's one of the reasons I'm envious of those who write fiction. It's also one of the reasons I think why fiction writers have to be careful. I don't know if any of you have read The Invention of Wings. Have you come across it recently? It's a, it's a fictionalized version of the life of Sarah Grimke, um, oh. the Quaker abolitionist, and her sister, and her slave that she's given as a child. And I found myself throughout that book, it's a very engaging story, it's beautifully written, but throughout that book I found myself saying, how do you know? How do you know that? You can't say that. How do you know that? And having to remind myself this is fiction, although a lot of people take it for fact. But um, yeah, I think that's a, a challenging and interesting, and maybe the fiction writers should. I, if I, 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 can, I can actually give an example that just happened like two days ago. Um, so the, the book that I'm writing now is actually a departure from the academic style. My first two books are very academic in their, their structure. They're driven by argument. They're thematically organized. Um, the book that I'm writing now is more novelistically structured. It's um, the stories of nine different people who are in the Southwest during this period from 1861 to 68. And you move from viewpoint to viewpoint over time. And one of those people is a, an Apache chief named Mangus Coloradus, um, who engages in multiple ways with the Union and Confederate armies during this period um, and makes life very difficult for them. Um, and there's this moment, I actually have to, I have to kill him on Monday, which is, <laughs> is very sad. And so I'm trying to avoid it. But the, He's the only one who dies in the book, and it, and it makes, I may cry. But, the, but he's amazing. He's 70 years old at this time. He's the, the oldest um, living war chief of the, the Chiricahua Apaches um, in this region. And, and there's this story about him um, that appears in a couple of different accounts that at one point, a couple of years before the war, he goes into this mining town that's in his territory um, and tries to kind of parlay, because um, he's a great diplomat in addition to a war chief, which makes him fascinating. Um, and and there's this story that they don't like what he's trying to do to them, because they think he's manipulating them. And so they tie him up and they whip him. 
and that he uses this as an impetus then to seek revenge on Amer Americans in general and American troops. So the the story first appears um, in the in the account of an American Union soldier after the war in 1868, but then it also appears in an Apache oral history. And there's a historian, um, Edwin Sweeney, of, of Apache culture in Mangus, Colorado, who basically spends five pages of his book debunking this story and saying, I don't think this happened. Here are the reasons why. It doesn't show up in these other places. So if I were writing in my academic style, I would say, you know, there's some debate about whether he was whipped at this moment. You know, it is possible that he then took this as an impetus to attack Union troops in these various places. But in this, the way that I'm telling this story now, I have to sort of know if this really happened, right? So I've been checking with all of my friends who are Apache history experts, and they're like, well, it could have happened. And I'm like, this is not helpful, right? Because I need to, like, if he's going to throw off his his shirt and show everyone his scars and like rally people to battle, I need to be able to footnote that. I need to be able to say that, and at this point, I'm not comfortable enough with that, so I'm not including it. So, but this is, so this is like, because we were talking before about the sort of how do you know, this how do you know question, um, which I know I'm going to get from historians throughout this book, because they're just not going to. They're not going to like it. They're not going to like what I'm doing. But I just want to add to that: if you're writing, if you're attempting to write um, his, not historical fiction, but um, history, um, one of the biggest challenges for engaging audiences is being able to include dialogue. Um, the fiction writer can create dialogue, <laughs> right. and letters are just a marvelous source for being able to insert dialogue, letters and diaries and things like that. But that dialogue is a great gift for fiction writers that you can create that. So I do make up my characters. And um, I put them in the time and the place. And history happens to them. The, the events, you know, be it truthful or be it whatever. I apply the history to these characters. And the challenge for me is for those characters to react to the history in a way that's consistent with their personalities. Now, um, I have one character, a, le a partisan leader, who is very, very loosely based on a real person, um, Yonai Lemkos. And he was a uh, partisan fighter in the late 1940s who actually escaped through the Iron Curtain, went to the West to try to garner support for the uh, resistance fighters. And what he did after a few years of uh, trying to contact politicians and local Lithuanian groups and other Eastern European uh, leaders who were influ influential in the United States. After all that, he went back to Lithuania. And of course, the Soviets found out about it and you know, it did not end well. So my character, my leader of the partisan group, um, I had him leaving the country. And I had him coming back to the country. And when my editor saw this, he had a fit. He said, this character cannot come back to the country because it's not consistent with who that person was. Mm -hmm. So there, there is a tremendous <laughs> amount of latitude. Whether Now, if I were writing about that man, about Jonas, uh, Jonas Lempis, um, it would be a different story. The dialogue might be the, you know, the place where some poetic license is allowed. But in creating characters similar to it, you know, I really had to buckle down and decide who that character was and what he would do in that circumstance. And it had nothing to do with the man who actually lived. I, I think to respond a little bit and maybe try and drive the conversation a little bit forward, um, there's, there's this whole discussion which is happening around sort of history and truth. Uh, what happened? How do we know what happened? And how do we tell that story? Uh, is fiction, in some cases, a better vehicle for getting at the truth of what happened um, than, than historical writing? Um, there, there's also, um, you know, we had one sort of effort at sort of putting 
the panelists into different types of categories. Uh, I've been listening to this a little bit in terms of the lens of academically trained historians, non-academically trained historians. And one of the things we're hearing from the academically trained historians um, is this notion of history is constructed. Um, this notion that, um, you know, that, that part of this is, is what I might refer to as the postmodern insight. Uh, that everybody who's writing about the past uh, themselves has a past. They have a position in society. They have a social class. They have a race. They have a gender. They have whatever. Um, and that those realities shape the stories they tell about the past. Um, and, and part of what's happened since the 1960s in historical writing is that if, if someone was writing history prior to the 1960s, you could almost be guaranteed, at least in this country, uh, that they were white, that they were male, uh, that they were highly educated, uh, and probably raised at least in the you know, upper middle class or, or above. And there's exceptions to this, but, that's, but that, as a general rule, that, that's pretty true. Um, and, and what starts to happen with the 1960s and into the 1970s is that the people doing the writing of history uh, begin, and this is still a process, to become much more diverse. Uh, and so the types of questions that are being raised about the past, the type of, types of perspectives w from which the past is being written suddenly look, look very different. Um, the book by Laurel Thatcher Ulrich, A Midwife's Tale, was mentioned. Uh, they actually made a PBS uh, documentary about this. And, it, and it's fascinating because she started out with a diary of Martha Ballard which had been around, everybody knew about it, male historians had looked at it and said, there's nothing there, it's stupid, it's, it's trivia, nobody cares about this. Um, and, and Laurel Ulrich looks at it and says, oh my goodness, this is this entire window into a world that otherwise would have been lost. And then she has to do the work of, well, what really happened? And, and as she describes that, it's, it's unbelievable. Okay, I've got these maps, mm -hmm. I, I got these mm -hmm. tax records. Mm -hmm. You know, what's the social classes? What are the political divisions? Mm -hmm. What are the religious divisions? And then she can start telling that story. Um, but, but there's a sense in which for this story to be told, it has to be told by a woman uh, because the men can't see the story there. Uh, but she has to take all the skills of the trained academic historian and to, to recreate this world, um, which she can't do if she doesn't have all those skills and can create those contexts. Um, and, and so there's this, this tension. I mean, I define to my students, history is the sense that we make of the past and the present. Um, and so what's happening in the present is always changing the questions that we're asking about the past. And I think there's a lot of that going on right now. What actually happened in the Civil War? How do we remember that? Mm -hmm. How do we make meaning from that today? Um, and, and so we fight about it. Uh, but we fight about it because it's important to us and that there is, there is a truth there um, that, that needs to be told. Um, but how do we go about telling that? And I think the question that, that I ask myself a lot is that academic historians over the past generation have become really, really good at deconstructing, taking apart sort of the received narratives and saying, these don't work anymore. Uh, they don't work for these reasons. Um, and, and one of the questions I've been asking myself is, OK, we've deconstructed. We have all these little stories from all these little different perspectives. Can we reconstruct narratives uh, that are perhaps more inclusive, that, that tell some of the stories that have been left out? Can we include oral history stories from Native American sources? Or do we, in effect, privilege the stories that were written down by often the conquerors of those people? How do we, how do we get their voice in if we say their voice can't be included because it wasn't written? Um, and, and so that's, that's sort of the questions that, that I wrestle with. Tim, there's a, there's a, 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 a,
trap in all of this that occurs to me. And, and um, I, I think what you're saying is, is absolutely correct in every respect, and we can and we need to do this. But, but I think it's imperative that, that we understand the distinction between history and historical fiction. Uh, and there's, if we go too far down this path, that blends. Uh, and, and all of us, I dare say, all of us know that we've come up against that very fine line between history and historical fiction. And uh, I know myself uh, in Battle Farmers at one point, I went over that line and I created a scene that, that I can't verify actually existed. And I, and I, I know that it was historically uh, accurate in terms of what was going on at that time and what actually works, but I can't actually place those individuals on, at that spot at that time. It's a very difficult uh, issue to, to, to know where that line is and, and to make sure you don't cross it. Um, and I, I particularly, um, it's a partic particularly critical for me because it was a book, I don't know if anybody is familiar with a book called Peter's War that came out uh, four or five years ago. Um, and Hollis, please don't write this down because it's not a book. It's not a book that you want to read. It was. It was. Um, uh, I mean, maybe it is, but you have to read it. You have to read it with the right understanding of it. Um, it is. It is uh, written by a uh, Georgetown professor. Uh, it is published by Yale, and it is um, purported to be uh, a feat of of research and investigation. Completely not, completely nonfiction. The reality is, it is complete fiction, uh, and it's it's an unfortunate, an unfortunate bridge against uh, on this issue. I mean, I think you, I think the the writer and the reader has to know there's a there's a there's a contract there. Is this an attempt at writing history, or is it an attempt? Can, can I ask you, like, how did you, did you, in that scene in your book, did you end up deleting it, or did you put it in italics and sort of say mm -hmm. to your reader, this didn't happen, but it could have, or did you just leave it in there? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Megan, I'm not sure what I did with it, actually. Um, I, I, <laughs> I, I, I was, I, I, and I was, I was sort of aware that I was, that I was crossing the line. I mean, I had evidence that, that what came out of that, scene was was valid. I had evidence that that scene was recreated on on town commons across New England. Um, and so I had all the inputs um, and and where I crossed the line was simply um, drawing a line between those various those the, connecting the dots that way. Um, uh, how did I represent it? Uh, I hope I footnoted it to say, well, we don't know that this <laughs> Um, but we'll have, we'll look after the meeting. And see <laughs> <it>. <laughs> yeah. um, so you were you used the term of the skills that trained historians use, or something along those lines. Um, so I like to write um, about women, and I like to put them in other contexts because I learned from that with the research. What maybe you're going to take this here anyway? But what are the skills? that, you know, at least a minimum of research that someone should do if I'm going to write about a woman, say, between the world wars? Uh, I think I'll pass that on to um, <laughs> some of the more academic, at least further academically trained historians than I am. Um, but, but it, you know, especially in terms of, you know, as you are teaching students or, or teaching grad students, you know, the skill of writing history, um, you know, what would be the three or four most important um, ideas or concepts that you would want them to take away from that? So. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I, I would say I, my PhD is in American Studies, which is an interdisciplinary field. So I do as much research in whatever is available to me. Um, and so just as another example, one of the other protagonists in the book um, is a woman named Louisa Camby, who's married to Edward Camby, who is a general. Um, I have nothing in her own voice. I have no letters. I have no diaries, which I think is astonishing. I, there, 
I'm crossing my fingers that they're somewhere because she she was an army wife who traveled with her husband to every single posting that he had from the Seminole Wars through the Indian Wars of the 1860s. I'm like, how is she not writing to her siblings? How is she not doing all this stuff? But for the moment, I have nothing in her voice. So how do I reconstruct her world? There are people who talked about her, which is how I knew about her in the first place. So I've got those records. I have some diary records. I've got some newspaper articles. And then I've got him. I've got the husband, right? Who is fully tracked through his entire career, has produced volumes of reports and all of these other things. So I can actually track her movements. I know exactly where she was because she followed him. Um, but there was this moment, I know they had a child. She appears on the census in 1850. And then she appears nowhere else. And all of the biographers say that she died when she was very young in California before they even went to New Mexico. But then I found a reference to the daughter in Utah as part of the Mormon Wars. And I was like, Mary was there. She's 15. And then there's nothing. And everyone in Santa Fe during the Civil War talks about her as being a childless woman. So I'm like, where did she go? And so in that chapter, I just have a bracket that says, at some point about this time, Mary either, there are two options. She either dies in Utah, or my other theory, and if I were writing this as fiction, she would have run off with a Mormon, <laughs> right? Because, because women disappear in the 19th century into marriage. And she would have not been talked about ever again if she had run off with a Mormon. So maybe right? that's what happened. So, may, you know, <laughs> if this were, if it, but again, I don't know, right? But so that kind of research, you re, and, and I was finding a lot of this stuff actually on, um, oh, what's the genealogical website? Why am I? Ancestry. Ancestry. So I was finding census records and some interesting things on Ancestry. Um, and then I was doing a lot of background research into army wives there really isn't a lot of, which I find surprising. Um, and then I was just doing research on all of the places where she was, using other kinds of records to try and build her world, right? But I think all of us probably agree, and it's probably different for, for everyone, but you know, you, you kind of reach a point with the research where you know you have enough, and it's time to write about the person. And there may be other things that you fill in later. I mean, I'm in a situation, what Megan described for pretty much my, my entire yeah. current project, which is I'm trying to understand if you were a slave uh, from the slaveholding class and you were an officer in the Confederate Army, you would likely have brought what they would have called a body servant, one of their slaves, to serve as a camp servant or what I call a camp slave. And so I'm trying to understand the relationship between these white officers and their enslaved people how it evolved over the course of the war, uh, motivation on both sides, why did certain people stay, some left, ran away. Um, what happened during the war? What, what happened to this relationship? How do you characterize it? And I would say out of the hundreds of letters that I've you know, used for, for this book, uh, I, I might have three uh, primary sources that are supposedly authored by slaves themselves, but I actually think they were off, they were actually authored or written by their, by the officers, by their owners. And so here I am, you know, middle-aged white man from New Jersey, uh, left having to look through to, to get any sense of what the experience might have been like for a camp slave to look at the diaries and letters of white men from the mid 19th century. And so I'm almost sort of twice removed, um, you know, if you consider sort of what I have to overcome to try to at least put myself in some kind of position to understand what that would have been like. And at times, getting back to this whole distinction between writing narrative history or history and historical fiction, at times, I, I do feel like I am. It's just pure speculation. And, you know, sometimes when people sort of push me in certain directions about some of the conclusions I'm, I'm drawing. It's like I sometimes just say, I, I don't really know. And yet those are the conclusions. That's, that's the history I'm writing. And it's very, 
I mean, talk about walking on slippery rocks. It's, um, <laughs> it's like Esther, I, I know you're writing. And um, you're asking specifically between the wars. And um, I know that you are a very character-driven writer. And I think, taking away from what the other panelists said, I think that part of the advice is to figure out the story you want to tell and then let that guide your research. So um, it is all about the detail. Uh, do, do sweat the detail. Um, uh, get, the, get a sense of the culture, get a sense of the attitudes, get a sense of the politics if it's relevant to the story you want to tell about your women. And try to narrow that picture down and then again really get into as much detail as you possibly can to advance your story and your point. Can I just, so just to, I um, love what has been said already to just kind of um, attach Tim's question back to your original question. Um, what would be the kind of core essential couple of skills? I think we've heard um, kind of doggedly pursuing the right sorts of questions mm -hmm. through whatever sources we do have. And I think also recognizing the limits and biases of the archives, of the archival record. Um, and, but not stopping with the archival record because that is insufficient. It, it, it has its own story to tell and your story needn't be determined by the limits of the archive. Um, I think the other two skills that I would just put out there would be um, the ability to manage that research in terms of like literally the logistics of research management um, and just like w in what form are you taking it away from the archives and how are you organizing that and how are you taking your notes on that and how are you being careful about your sources so, and that's like those sort of like really nuts and bolts skills is a lot of what I work with my students on and then having the um, awareness of the scholarly conversation about the broader picture of what it is you're looking at. So women between the wars, what are the, what are the current debates among scholars about women? Like what, what are they talking about so that you know exactly where in that conversation you begin to interject your story? Like where, what your story adds to that conversation. Does that make sense? So I think having the ability to just under, to grasp access, First of all, access, because I know it's not all open access to, to non-affiliated researchers, but to be able to access and understand the scholarly literature is an important skill as well. I would also just add, and I, I think this goes for any topic, um, because more and more of our research is being conducted online, mm -hmm. and this was very much uh, my focus when I, when I was in the classroom, uh, just be very careful about what you're coming across online. Yeah. You know, be ca very yeah, careful about trust. sort of how yeah, you're right. searching for information, <laughs> and then even more careful about how you're assessing the websites mm -hmm. that um, your search engine is generating. And while I would agree with that caution, I would also strongly urge you to make full use of yeah. what you can find online. It's Absolutely. totally transformed in the last 10 Absolutely. or 15 years. Yeah. Now have access to um, scanned versions of primary source manuscript mm -hmm. documents mm -hmm. that you would have had to travel thousands yep. of miles for and Google Books can get you to yep. books that are, you know, were out of print 150 <laughs> years ago. It's, mm -hmm. it's fantastic and more and more is coming online. Um, in terms of interpretation of that, you, you do have to remember that it is, it's the internet, so. <laughs> <laughs> School, newspapers. If you haven't done newspapers, get yourself a newspaper subscription, either newspapers.com or Genealogy Bank. You can also do it through Ancestry if you have a subscription, but it's not so easy there. Um, it, because the newspapers of the United States from that period are all published, and you can search in those newspapers. And this is you know, a project I'm working on. And you will, it's unlimited. You always have to take it through the lens of the reporter and who the reporter was talking to, but you will get, you will find so much stuff. You had a question? Yeah, um, I, just to sort of add to the, what are the, what are the genres that, that mm. make use of history? Um, I recently read, audio read, um, <laughs> a, um, a book that I, 
brilliant in that it really sort of breaks a lot of the, the mold. Um, Thomas Jefferson, Dreams of Sally Hemings, an amazingly written book that sort of crosses history. It actually has um, excerpts from uh, so-called slave narratives, um, and um, it has fantasy, it has fiction, and it and it sort of opens another another way of addressing history and, and who you know some of these figures were the known and the unknown figures. You know Thomas Jefferson being in many ways one of the best known figures in you know, revolutionary history, and Sally Hemings being this person who you know is gradually. Um, so I, there, there's more choices than mm -hmm. history mm -hmm. and historical fiction mm -hmm. um, in the sense <laughs> of um, historical fiction in the sense of that's it's if you think of painting, it's almost like you know realism in painting. But there's there's mm -hmm. more possibilities mm -hmm. for how people can be creative, but also bring in you know these these primary sources they are hard to say as you as you point out but um, I think it's it's worth thinking about you know how we in this in this postmodern kind of uh, way of thinking about history um, can bring that um, can see all of you know more angles than, than those two categories might suggest the, the change of Industry over the past uh, whatever 10, 15 years um, has allowed this to happen with much more regularity. I mean, have you ever heard of the uh, genre Bollywood punk? Right. <laughs> I read some of it. It's actually kind of fun. It's you know, uh, but the thing is that um, is is writers and researchers. I venture we have more latitude to do things that. Uh, will find an audience. And in fact, among you, I know one writer who is mixing sci-fi with a little bit of uh, history. I believe it's the Chicago Fire. And uh, this gentleman has spent a tremendous amount of time getting the details right in that Chicago Fire. And it's put in this context of a very futuristic scenario. And I think it's creative and engaging. And I think many writers are thinking about that sort of twist to make the statement that they want to make more engaging to more readers. So I think you make a very, very good point. Yeah. I, I, well, I, I wanted to um, actually go ahead and then I'll talk. I was just going to say that from a, um, I think that's great. And I love genre kind of mixing and boundary crossing in that way. Um, the only issue is that I'm not sure that editors and publishing houses do. Um, when I, because my my book has such a different structure, um, it was actually kind of a hard sell out there on the, the trade book publishing market. Um, the comments about it from the people who declined to bid uh, were, it's not epic enough as a story about the Civil War in the West. I was like... <laughs> Two of our most popular and <laughs> fundamentally dramatic um, <laughs> developments in American history is the war and westward expansion. Um, not epic enough. Okay. Um, and then the issue with the but, and then the other issue was there are too many people because there were nine people. They said, really, there should just be one. And I was like, and I know who they wanted, and it was Kit Carson. <laughs> Um, who's one of the nine, um, because he was a Union Army colonel, which is something people don't know about either, really. Um, so, and I'm like, I'm not going to just write another biography of Kit Carson. I mean, there are enough of those out there. I'm not sure we need any more of that. But to, to weave his story in with all these other people actually illuminates some interesting things. Um, so, so it's difficult, right? Like, what if you have a, a genre-blending book like that, what's printed on the back that, that allows booksellers to file it in a place where someone can find it, right? Yeah. 
I mean, I'm not sure, you know, do any, does anyone go to bookstores anymore? I mean, maybe they do, but the, but even on Amazon too, like in the metadata, like that's how they get all of that, right? Like that's how you would find it in searching or would say, if you like this, you will also yeah. like this, right? Like that's all in this algorithm that's very specific and publishers are very mindful of that. So that's just, you know, I love, I love this idea. Um, I think it might be some more time yet before the... <laughs> The publishing world, if you really do want, you know, to to try and make some money or make a living with <laughs> your writing, it's a it's if a little want, bit harder. If you want yeah. to explore this, come to uh, the Thayer Library on November 18th, and we'll talk a little bit about self-publishing, but the afternoon session will talk about alternatives. So if you have, uh, for example, a cross-genre book, what are your best avenues for publishing it quickly? Um, what are the pros and cons of traditional versus small press, perhaps? Mm -hmm. So that entire discussion will be part of the afternoon session on November 18th. So uh, uh, go to the sevenbridgewriters.org website and uh, stay tuned. We'll have registration pages up there pretty soon, November 18th. Mark but it on to, your calendars. To build a little bit on um, what Megan about pitching to a publisher, which I think is, whether it's cross-genre or, or whether it's not, I think a um, really critical thing always to keep in mind is that you need to be able to make the big so what argument compellingly and very briefly. So when I was first pitching my book, it was all about community study and what had happened in these little villages and blah, blah, blah. And I needed to be able to come to the point of saying, um, this era has been called the age of homespun, the classic quiet age of um, spinning wheels and one-room schoolhouses. It was not. It was an age of incredible tumult and conflict. And this is the story of how that happened in one village and why it's reflected across the nation. And they, that sold a lot better than what I was so focused on, which is, of course, the 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 wonderful story of this particular local area, it needs, you need, we need to be able to sell the bigger picture. And that's critical in pitching, pitching a book, yeah, saying why it matters. Mm -hmm. I, I was having a conversation with my students uh, the other week about textbooks. Um, and I asked them the question, what is the purpose of textbooks? Mm -hmm. And it took them a little bit to get there, but, but we finally reached the, the purpose of textbook is to make money for textbook publishers. <laughs> um, and, and so the, you know, when, when we're talking about writing history, you know, publishers want to publish the books that are going to make them money, and they want to publish a book about Kit Carson because there have been a lot of them, and they know people are interested, and they know they can make money. Um, and, and so this, you know, the, the demands of the market, so to speak, are, are ever-present. Um, I, I wanted to circle back a little bit to these questions of, of perspective and accuracy and, and truth. I, I, I brought in a, a couple props for me. Uh, one was this somewhat controversial <laughs> book that came out a number of years ago by Edmund Morris called Dutch, which he titles A Memoir of Ronald Reagan. And even the title is important because mm -hmm. it's a biography, but it's not. Now, now, he has as many documents and access. I mean, this is an American president. They've got all the film footage. He actually had a, an office in the White House in 1987 and 1988. Uh, and he finally reached the conclusion that um, it was almost impossible for him to discover Ronald Reagan's inner life. And, and Ronald Reagan is best on camera and so he could not tell the story of Ronald Reagan without making up scenes in which he inserted himself as a character in those scenes. And, and he documented this. And there was a lot of discussion when the book came out. Uh, but, but the sense of the historical community was, you can't do this. You're cheating. You can't make <laughs> stuff up. Uh, and of course, you know, the, the other concern is it's in the footnote, but... You know, no, nobody reads the footnotes. And then, and then I was thinking of this, this other book, 
Um, which some people would say I, I inflicted on a generation of students at Neshoba Regional High School. Uh, it actually showed up in two valedictory addresses and not always in a positive way. And one of those addresses, one of those addresses was by my own daughter. So, but, uh, but, but what's so interesting about this is that part of what we're talking about is recovering lost stories. Um, and, and if most of the stuff in the archives is by upper class white men or government bureaucrats, how do we recover the lost stories? Um, and so this book, The Unredeemed Captive, um, it refers to um, a woman, a young woman, Eunice Williams, who grew up in uh, Deerfield. Her dad was a minister. Um, and there was a Native American raid on Deerfield, and she was, she along with the rest of her family, was captured and brought up to uh, the Montreal area in a Native American settlement called Ganawaga. Um, and and he has he has you know the sermons and everything written and published by the dad. He's got the sermons and everything written and published by the brother, um, and he has almost nothing from her. Um, and and so he finally reaches the point where he makes up a scene. He has, this is everything I know. I'm going to put it in italics mm -hmm. and tell you how I am imagining this probably went. And, and it's interesting, you know, he, he's an older white male historian. Um, he, he told this story once at the American Antiquarian Society about this, that, that he actually got accused of raping her that trying to get into the mind of this young woman, uh, him as an older white male, uh, that, that he's not even supposed to go there. He's trying to empathize. Um, you know, he, he would say he's still hoping that somewhere, someplace, somewhere, you know, they'll uncover her version of the story, that it's lost in some archive, but hasn't happened yet. Um, but, but so, you know, he's completely clear. I made this up. But this is the evidence I'm making it up based on. And I think, and he was using some Freudian theory and other things uh, as a way of trying to get at this internal experience. Um, but, but even that becomes, you know, is seen by some people as problematic. Um, and so this, this line of, the, there's times where the narrative, the story demands, in a sense, that, that we break a rule, sometimes we need to be explicit. Yes, we're breaking a rule here. We know we're breaking a rule here. Please know I'm breaking a rule here. Mm -hmm. um, but, but that you're not really telling the story without doing that. And so I, I wanted to get this sense about rule breaking and truth telling in history narrative. So I, I, just real fast, it might be helpful to put this conversation and this particular question maybe in, in an a historical context itself, you don't have to go back that far, you know, to the late 19th century. I mean, that's really where this notion or, or the professionalization of history really begins, right? We start sending people over to Germany for these advanced degrees, and this notion, as I understand it, of, you know, history being professionalized, that we're going to sort of worry about historiography and truth and footnotes or endnotes and all of this stuff, that, that this is a relatively recent development when it comes to how we think about the writing of history. I mean, if you go back and look at mid 19th century historians, um, the writing is more about, as I understand it, um, you know, about engaging uh, stories about morality, about, about values, not necessarily about simply telling the truth as, in a strict sense as we understand it today. And it seems like some of our discussion, and, that, and this may be justified, um, sort of is starting with the assumption that how academics, and I'm saying this as someone who was rejected from a PhD program um, back in 2003, um, that, that somehow uh, this is the standard and everything else is being judged against it. And I'm, and I'm wondering if it might be better just to think of the kind of writing that some of us do up here is just one along a spectrum, uh, just one example of how we try to um, use the past to make sense of the present, because it seems to me that's what it all has in common, right? It's, it, we're, we're trying to understand ourselves uh, in time and, and place and, and our surroundings, and it seems to me 
there are different ways to go about that um, through the engaging of, of the past, trying to understand the past. So I just want to throw that out there as just something maybe to keep in mind as we push forward. Thoughts from the panelists? Oh, sure. David. Just something. In, I'm David Stanko. I teach history and science at Worcester Polytechnic Institute. And I write about the early 19th century and development um, technology and ideas about Earth and its history in the American culture in New York State and the country. And uh, one thing that struck me the early question about the footnote apparatus, and then Ursula's point about how you know publishers need to keep track of things too. Um, the older books that you read have footnotes that take up mm -hmm. half or more of the page. <laughs> no publisher will let you do that now. Mm -hmm. you, if you have footnotes at all, they're, they're stuck mm -hmm. at the end, which mm -hmm. means the reader will not consult you. So mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a teaching of the reader mm -hmm. to uh, sequester themselves from the evidence. And the footnotes <laughs> used to yep. be rich. Yep. In other words, it wasn't just what I'm teaching my students now, which is you have to cite your source, so I need to see all the yep. uh, you know, publication, author name, date, page number. I have to have that page number. Um, but footnotes <laughs> in, in older texts are their own narratives. Yeah. Right. Right. And, and that's often where the most interesting evidence yep. is examined. Yep. And maybe uh, questions about that yep. evidence could be could be broached. Uh, so that you have a you still have a linear narrative, but you now have all of the all of the thinking that went behind why and whether this evidence relates to the claim made in the narrative. And so I think <coughs> the trends to make readable narratives long primary source excerpts are no longer acceptable. Mm -hmm. But they used to be a staple of light mm -hmm. letters, mm -hmm. types of books mm -hmm. that are rich, wonderful sources in themselves. Um, so the kind of history that can be written is challenged. Mm -hmm. And I think the kind of reader sophistication mm -hmm. that it takes to um, learn from history is being simplified. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm noticing all of these trends, and I'm thinking mm -hmm. that uh, I'd love to see a resurrection of, um, <laughs> of rich uh, footnote on the same page. You know, the historical journals still do it, yeah. but the pub yeah. published books don't. Mm -hmm. And so I want to sort of throw that in. Yeah. Uh, again, we're in a historical moment in writing It is, it is an interesting moment, too, though, because um, the I know what I'm going to face when I finish the book and go through all this. Right now, I'm footnoting everything with full citations and the footnotes. Mostly that's because I rearrange a lot of stuff, and the revision <laughs> process will re- and I don't want to lose. I don't want to have some floating IBID out there, like, what was that a reference to the first time around? Um, so they are, they are full notes. Um, my editor... Who, by the way, the, the editor who ended up per buying the book um, is a fiction editor at Scribner. So that's interesting. Um, and she has no interest in the footnotes. Like, I think I asked her, like, are you going to read? And she was just like, <laughs> she sort of looked at me like, you idiot? Like, what? I'm not going to read your footnotes. Um, that's your job. Um, and I know what's going to happen is that they're going to do that thing that most trade books do, which is they just have the piece quote and then a list of shortened citations. Probably a bibliography, but I'm sure it will be only the things that are cited in the book and not anything extra. But here's the, here's the interesting thing that we have now, which is the internet, right? So I have a website and I'm already, pla I'm planning this already, um, that, that I'm gonna create a, you know, a new page that's devoted to the book that will have posts on sources. Um, and I'm also hoping that they'll let me write just a short, the other thing is a note on sources mm -hmm. where you can mm -hmm. talk about kind of what you used and how many sources you used. And, the cha and also this is the place to, to talk about the challenges of the archive, right? For where you have people, kind of voiceless people, how do you recreate their stories? Like I'm sure you're gonna have one mm -hmm. of these. And so, you know, how to use photographs, how to use textiles, how do you use all of this different kind of stuff to, to put the story together. So, so that hopefully will be an addition um, to the book if they'll give me a couple pages for that. Um, and, but if not, then I'll do it online. And it's so easy for people to just 
you know, they'll just kind of go online and click on it. Um, and then there you can have a, a richer discussion of all of these things and sort of where does it fit in the field. And, you know, because I am absolutely not allowed to, to reference any other historian in the text of the, of the book, right? This is a narrative history. Like, they don't, the other historians do not exist. So I am not the, they are, I know, I know, it's totally crazy. Um, I sort of love it though. It's so it is freeing in that sense, but, but they, you know, I'm only, I'm, I should only be quoting primary documents and not, I do not quote from other historians. I take their, you know, I read all the other historians and then there's a footnote, but I convey their, if I'm gonna convey their arguments, I convey it in other words and then I note them, right? And they'll be in the acknowledgement section. And they'll be in the acknowledgement section. All those who have come before, <laughs> yes. But this, I mean, these are the, again, this, that's a very specific context for a kind of trade history. Um, but there are multiple ways to go about it now that I think are, because I, I also, I'm also hoping that on the web I'll be able to do some of those geographic information system maps to show all my people moving over time in concert with one another. That's not possible in the book, right? But it is possible online now. So there, there is an interesting, you know, back and forth. If they don't read the notes at the end of the book, will they read them online? Maybe. David, <laughs> we'll see. David, you, you use the phrase simplifying um, history, and that kind of sticks with me. Um, from the other side of the spectrum, um, I cite references in Amber Wolf. Um, there are a dozen or so books that I pour <coughs> through to do this, and it's not footnotes, but it, again, it tries to Do you have enrich... a note on sources at the end? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, it, it tries to enrich the reader's experience. So mm -hmm. if they are interested in that slice of history, there are other places they can go for more information. But I think that one thing that fictionalizing the history, um, and I, I hope that good writing does this, I hope it challenges you because it. I hope it puts you in the moment of the history, um, so that, you know, if if your child, if 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 you're gone and your child has to face a critical decision as to whether to hide from a Soviet soldier or go up and kill them, um, what would your child do? I, I I hope that good writing puts you in the moment like that. Mm -hmm. Now, in a certain respect, yes, it is simplifying, <laughs> but. I, I think it's also personalizing it to a great degree to kind of engage you and put you in the moment. And perhaps that has some value in itself. Great question. Um, I was curious about, uh, uh, from the public standpoint, when you're reading a book, and I agree with you about uh, the footnotes can be very convincing in the older manuscripts you come across. The readers today, are they interested in footnotes like that? I'm wondering. I mean, I think there are probably some people, probably the majority of people in this room would be, but they wouldn't be here. But I'm just curious about, in general, uh, if someone came across, out of the Republic, uh, uh, a quarter of a page of footnotes, would they be interested in that? Just, just out of curiosity. Students skip them. They skip them. Yeah. They said, like, oh, the page is shorter. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think certainly uh, publishers, especially um, you know, the, the, um, the big publishers, I mean, if you go back and look at the end notes, um, it, all, it, it often seems as if they're just trying to do the minimum in citing the sources. So quite often you'll see um, the quote that was mm -hmm. cited uh, on a particular page, and it'll have the quick reference to it. Um, but, but that's about it. You're not going to get the, um, sometimes the reflections on the historiography that you'll find in, say, academic books. My, my sense is that um, the average reader is not so, so interested so much in, in sources and endnotes. Uh, they're interested in a good story. That's, but is, it, is that driven by the reader or by the publisher? I think the publisher. <laughs> so I think they're also, in, in many, the marketing of the book, Many, at least from what I've heard, uh, depends on the number of pages. They're thinking about price point, things like that. So mm -hmm. they're trying to constrain, in some cases, you know, just mm -hmm. the, the number of pages, things like that. 
Yeah. So sometimes the endnotes, I guess, are shaped along yeah. those lines. And only the true history nerds are really interested in like the infighting, right? The like I I always when I was teaching, I'd be like, thing. let's let's uh you know read these footnotes. And there was there was one glorious footnote. I can't even remember in what text where where the author cited both her ex-husband and her ex-husband's new wife. Like, and I was like, oh my God, let me tell you about this. And the, and the students were just like, I don't understand why you care. And I'm like, but it's okay. Yeah. But they, yeah, there's just not, and with, you know, state of the field stuff, I think academics are super interested in that. And I think there are ways to kind of, you know, if you if you are really pushing against someone who is very prominent in the field, then maybe, you know, people who are, you know, in Civil War history, there's this huge readership of Civil War nerds who just completely love that stuff, right? Because there are some revered historians. And if you go after that historian, they're sort of like, ooh, you know, and they, they can be kind of excited by that, but but that's a small percentage. I would say. I don't know if anyone has ever done that. Oh. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add one quick point. Uh, I, I have a recollection from college of a professor really pointing out a footnote. Is it, go to page 17, the footnote right here. Um, and it was, it was so significant in part because of one of those internal dialogues. They had taken um, something which was a standard book in the field and essentially said, we don't need to pay any attention to that. The entire book's wrong. Um, and, and it was interesting because at the, you know, at the time, they're also sort of modeling things. So, so I tried to pull that in a paper that I wrote in college, uh, and it did not go over very well. It was just you know, dismissing an entire book. And, and I actually still kind of dismiss that entire book today. But, but you know, there's sort of the point at which it's considered acceptable to do that. And, and the point at which it's not. And, and that raises some questions. I hate to wrench this from the really interesting philosophical <laughs> approach to history and narrative. However, I'm old enough to remember uh, index cards. Today I use Scrivener and I use EndNote for my work. Um, there are yellow pads as well. You know, we do everything. And I'm curious to know what who uses here uh, to pull all this stuff together when you're getting really into the um, the uh, mode of assembly. Let's talk about our tools. Mm -hmm. yes. yeah. Let's open our toolboxes. I love it. I can't wait to hear what everybody else is going to say. What do you well, do? What do you do? Well, I <laughs> I need I need help with this, so I, I need I I want to learn. I I'm I want to talk to somebody who uses Scrivener. I've never used it. Okay, so I'll talk later. Um, I use Zotero mm -hmm. for my research management because um, it's free, open source, built by scholars for scholars, and I really like it. So that's what I use. Yep. Um, and then I just you have Zotero and Word. And I have a really complicated um, in filing system for my, in the archives, I tend to take photographs of documents, because that's what you're allowed to do in the archives these days, rather than notes, um, and, which is nice. It's changed, really changed the workflow in the archives. So I, I leave the archives with gigantic amounts of digital photographs of documents. Um, so I know there are ways to turn those photographs from JPEG into PDF and to combine them into documents. I don't have a research assistant to do that with me, so I'm just keeping them as JPEGs. So I have this really complicated. Yeah, I know there is an app. For that. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's why I want. That's why I want to hear about other people's tools. But right now I just have a um, complicated naming <laughs> system, so I rename all the photographs so that the image bears the. And these are all just saved in. Okay. Yeah, and then they're just saved. Yep. And so then I could essentially by by pulling an image, I could. It, it, it basically has the footnote in the image title. So that's my system. What, 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 what do you got, guys? I, I'll just say I, I also use Zotero, especially for bibliographies. And then um, the rest of it's a complete mess. And, <laughs> and, um, that's, and, nice that's, and that's the way I like it. It, it, makes, it makes sense to me. Um, <laughs> I feel like I'm on the cusp, but you know, I, I'm sort of on that boundary between sort of the traditional way of doing things, note cards, um, paper and the digital stuff. And um, I never quite, you know, there are certain aspects of the digital that I embraced and um, and the tradition and mainly sort of just trying to just toe the part, you know, just keep going on the traditional line. And 
you know, at this point, it doesn't make any sense for me to try to change. It's just yeah. not, I mean, <laughs> it, it just doesn't. Yeah. 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 Like digital books. Yeah. I mean, like e-readers, forget oh. it. You yeah. know, I, I just can't do it. I want to be able to write in the pages, yeah. underline, and have it and smell it. And, yeah. you know, yeah. that's part well, of the experience. I'm, yeah. I'm a, if one can be a technological Luddite, I am that. Um, because what I will usually do is read a text. I'll do, I can I can do it online. I've gotten more kind of adept at doing that, um, and I'll, either online or on paper. And then I I'll have a note file for that source. Then I cut and paste those into a chapter file, which then gets reorganized as I go um, into different parts of the chapter. So it'll be like context. You know, if we're talking about Louisa Canby. Army Wives context, Louisa Canby biography, you know, the photograph of her. So I do have a photograph of her, like, a, you know, and other kinds of stuff. And then I just keep adding to those thematically. Um, and I find that what that does is then I have a two-layer process where I've read the text and then through typing the note, it gets lodged in my brain a little more firmly. And then through organizing it in my notes, it's even more firmly kind of put in my brain is how, how is this going to turn up on the page? Then when I get ready to write, I'm sorry, trees, I print it all out. <laughs> then I take notes on that and highlight. So I go through many highlighters. Um, and then when I sit down to write, I have those pages, sometimes a couple books, but mostly just the pages because it's functionally an outline, um, even though I also have the notes on my computer screen. And that's and I use that to cut and paste for footnotes. Um, so that's that's the process. But the most important thing is that all of it is on in Dropbox. Yes. yes. So it it absolutely Ditto. if it if it is on my um, the uh, if it's if it's just thank you. I'm like what am I even? Oh my God, I need more coffee. But the <laughs> if it's on my desktop, it's also then in iCloud. So that, and then I always put it then in Dropbox. I used to, before that existed, I would email stuff to myself so that I had a digital copy. But the cloud is amazing and everyone should use it mm -hmm. because if your laptop implodes or if your computer is stolen, you still have all of your work. Because if you, you know, when, when I was in grad school and I was writing my dissertation, like I didn't have any of that. Like if my if my computer got stolen, it was over. Like I would have had to quit my PhD because I would have had nothing, right? Um, so yeah, so that that has really changed. That just makes me feel much more secure. Like every day, it is constantly being updated in Dropbox. So I even if my computer freaks out, I at most only lose a couple of sentences. So the non-academic fiction girl has a system. <laughs> um, I uh, put all of my references I can online with uh, files for links. And then the data is in a spreadsheet. So I have character, I have character yeah. sketches, when people small. were born, what they did, all in <laughs> spreadsheets yeah. and the history, um, uh, events, dates, uh, mm -hmm. uh, 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 political speeches, all of that is in spreadsheets that I can reference in the text very explicitly. So um, my early drafts have um, material that I can validate very quickly. Of course, uh, later drafts has, have to remove all of those uh, uh, references, but um, that's how I do it. Everything's online, and uh, spreadsheets are, are essentially what I use. When you say online, what do you mean? On my computer. Oh, it's on your computer. On it's my not computer. On the internet, waiting to be um, yeah. links, are, links. links are. I put links either in a spreadsheet uh, as, as a, a, a data point mm -hmm. relevant to a subject, or I have files with relevant links, mm -hmm. or I load down, I, I download uh, uh, the material mm -hmm. and just keep it so I can reference it. Richard and Mary, did you want to add on the yeah. research process? Add to that. If, if, if Megan Kate is a, is a Luddite, I'm a dinosaur. <laughs> um, and I find, I, I find that, that um, I mean, I do, I do bits and pieces of, I think, of what everybody has been talking about in, in, in some respects. But, but I find the fastest, as soon as I 
as soon as I get some nuggets that I want to put into my story, I put them into my story. I, I don't wait. I don't wait around, and I put them in with a, with enough reference that I can find that source again if I need to. But but you know, I don't have this. I don't have these this vast files of stuff out there. No, it's, <laughs> it's uh, I need I need to learn from you all. <laughs> We learn from you. We'd write books a lot faster. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, actually, it, um, everyone's more advanced than I am, so I, I use note cards. I sit down mm -hmm. on the floor with my note cards mm -hmm. and spread them out. Mm -hmm. um, the note cards are all printed out from things I've written online, so I don't have to retype things, but I, I'm, I'm before the dinosaurs. So. Yeah. <laughs> but I did actually want quickly to move back to your question about... Um, the essential skills, just to make a plea for one particular type of skill or, or, um, or technique that I discovered later, um, and it's paying attention to the unusual and the, mm. uh, the what Ooh. doesn't fit in. It's sort of a lesson from microhistory, the cheese and the worms and mm. all that. And it, it turned out to be so useful for me. When I was working with Mary White's diary, I came across a sentence that ended with two exclamation points. She said, mm -hmm. our slate of candidates has, has succeeded. Mary White never used punctuation, mm -hmm. period. And to mm -hmm. use two exclamation mm -hmm. points and just to pause long enough to say, well, why did she do that? And mm -hmm. to look into it became a major story. Mm -hmm. She was talking about the election of town officers, selectmen. Who cares? What she meant, our slate of officers, she meant from her church, the Congregational Church slate of officers oh. versus the mm. Unitarian Church. And it opened up story of a huge divide in this town. Mm. And it's just those little details, those mm. little specifics, mm. that little question marks, why did they do that, that I feel can lead to really rich stories. Great example. Yeah. So I, I um, read something once about uh, people who have relatively strong working memories uh, don't need to develop as established sort of research filing systems and things like that. Um, and, and sometimes I wonder if it's not just an excuse for a certain level of laziness about coming together, um, things like that. I mean, when, when I've done things, I, I usually try and break them into smaller pieces. Um, so, so I'm not working on a larger project. I'm working on a chapter or a subsection of a chapter. Um, and then my, my wife will tell you that I'll have papers and books and other things spread out all over the dining room table or uh, strewing onto the floors or things like that. And then I have a, you know, okay, I know I need that book. I know it's open to the right page. It's over there. Uh, but then we'll have a dinner party and the dining room has to be cleaned. And then that creates a little bit of an issue. But, um, but, but so, you know, I, you know, my sense is, is to use the organizational system that works for you. Uh, but you need to have an organizational system. And, and, you know, certainly I think most of us who have been writing for some time have experienced the crash computer or the lost file or the we had something that was great, but then they updated something and it's no longer compatible and the computer died and it can't be read on the new computer or, or whatever that happens to be. And that's where, um, you know, the, the cloud or you know, the, the Google suite where, where you have something in a format that at least presumably is, you're going to continue to be able to access. Um, that's, that's where the hard copies as well can be, can be wonderful. Um, I, I sometimes joke um, only partially self-servingly um, that still using paper incentivizes forest owners to keep their land in trees because if there was no market uh, for, for some of the trees to be cut down to create paper, then they might just clear cut the whole thing and turn it into another shopping mall or parking lot. Um, and, and so sometimes I get pushback from that. But, but there's a certain level of, of truth there as well. And, and I actually, you know, in class, I print out copies of notes for students and distribute them to them. To them. And people say, well, why do you do that? Just post it to your website, share it with them in the Google Classroom. And I say, because I want them to write on the notes. Mm -hmm. I want them to underline. I want them to highlight. Mm -hmm. I want them to annotate. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so the, the physicality of, of the research process and, and, I, and I like what Megan said about the, the, even if it's typing up the notes, mm -hmm. uh, that, that you are reflecting on what you're reading and you're actually thinking about how that fits in the narrative. 
Uh, there is some, I think, fairly recent psychological research that taking the notes longhand, actually writing them out, uh, makes it stick even better than typing it out. Um, now, if you're someone like me and no one can read your handwriting, then typing it might be a good idea. Um, but but so, so yeah, I, I think finding, finding a system that works. Um, I don't know if folks would like to comment briefly, this has come up a little bit, about sort of new techniques of, of researching or writing. I know Mary has done some work with kind of crowdsourced history, working with local historical societies to do some of the, the research. I know some of you are involved in blogging or other types of, of communication, but how has sort of new approaches or new technologies shaped your work as, as either storytellers or, or historians? Where I am, I mean, any success that I can claim as a writer, historian, uh, is the result of uh, my blog. Um, so back in 2005, I, after being rejected uh, by a PhD program, I was teaching full-time high school, and I decided I'll go back and do a master's degree. Uh, and I finished my thesis in the spring of 2005. In November of that year, I just started, just decided to give this new medium a shot. Uh, I called it Civil War Memory because that's the subject I'm interested in. Uh, and within about two years, it had become a fairly well-known website. And I was attracting a wide range of readers from some of the top academics in the field to uh, just an incredible range of just Civil War enthusiasts, really smart people. And I started getting invitations to write short pieces, to speak. Um, and eventually my first book contract uh, came as a result of my blog. I essentially wrote my first book on my blog, post by post. Um, and it gave me the opportunity, since I'm not, I don't, I'm not, I don't live in the academic community, I didn't necessarily have easy access to other scholars, but with each blog post, I got incredible feedback. So I had the benefit of uh, readers from a wide range of backgrounds. Uh, I think the you know what I eventually produced is in large part of you know a function of my own research and thinking, but as well as um, just the contributions of others. So um, for me, I mean, I am the product of social media in many respects. I can't imagine what I would be doing right now if it wasn't for that blog. It it made my it made my career. So. It, it gave me the chance to practice writing. Um, I think I'm very much a sort of meat and potatoes writer. I'm not a great writer. Um, but it, just the, the criticism and the critiques was, uh, has always been helpful. I still do it. Um, so that was not by design, but it's just the way it, the way it evolved. So it's just one, one experience. There are other ways, too, to use um, <clears throat> social media like Facebook and Twitter, um, not only to build communities and to kind of share your work, which is great, which is important, um, but also as a way to hone your writing style, too. And it, it's also for, you know, for crowdsourcing, it can be really useful. Um, I, I, I'm Facebook friends with a ridiculous amount of historians, um, number of historians, and so uh, basically every week there'll be some posts that'll be like, please help me read this word. Mm -hmm. What does this word say in this 19th century handwriting? Mm -hmm. Like, please, like, what is this? <laughs> or does anyone know, you know, any resources based on this? And, you know, you're, that's a way to kind of usefully kind of get, get other people's perspectives and things they may have run across. Um, but also something like Twitter, and th this hasn't happened, people haven't really been doing this, but what I've always been advising grad students now that I'm sort of out of academia and doing more public writing, um, and if you're going to pitch your book, thinking about it as a tweet is a useful thing, right? Because you're like, how would I, how would I describe my book in, a well, now 280 characters, but 140 characters? Um, because it really restricts you. You have to cut all of the extra language of maybe and probably and, oh, this does that. Like, it is, you have to be very direct. Um, and the, and, and Kevin can also probably speak to this too, but when you start writing op-eds and you start writing blog posts, um, <clears throat> you also, your, your 
tone changes a little bit um, in, into a, more of a direct, like, mm -hmm. I am going to give this, like, I am going to express my idea forcefully, like there, and, and because you are not footnoting and because you are not, you know, doing other things, it kind of frees you up um, to get a different kind of authorial voice. I'm not sure, you know, for, for other people, it may be different, um, but, these are the ways, these are all options now for different forms of writing um, that you can kind of play around with. If you have your own blog, you can write whatever you want, which I also do, and mm -hmm. it's fantastic. Um, <laughs> but then you can also pitch to other outlets like Slate or The Atlantic or The Washington Post has a new um, series called Made by History, mm -hmm. um, and you just pitch it to them. But you need to, but that's, pitching is an art form, right? And that's a, um, and so, <coughs> practicing your pitch on social media can be really helpful because it, it constrains you. You don't want to write some huge long post that goes past the dot, dot, dot on Facebook, right? Like, no one who clicks on that. Like, most people don't click on that, right? Um, and then Twitter will just cut you off. So, so it's, a, that's a, it's a nice experiment. And actually, someone on Facebook, there's a, um, there's a group called Illuminate on Facebook, which is for fans and writers of nonfiction. Um, not necessarily all historical, but um, but nonfiction, and they post every week about different things about like what are you reading, what is your kind of writing practice, things like this. And one of the one of the challenges last week was to describe your book in a haiku, which I thought was great, right? And it and it really kind of takes you out of your normal voice and kind of forces you to to economize with your words and put them in a different format, which I thought was really cool and that's you know that's something generated online which you know we didn't have even we had 10 years ago yeah. you know we, we are approaching the end of our time and I want to make sure we hear the the rest of the voices on uh sort of new media or, or new forms of, of research if you folks would like to add something side um social media so there there are two big things I think with social media and Every time you post something, be it to Twitter or Facebook or even an email, it adds to your identity as a writer. Mm -hmm. So it's very important to think that through and have some type of consistent message because if you don't, your readers will think you're scatterbrained and uh, usually they will say goodbye pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I found of value to social media is um, directing my emphasis a little bit so um, if I ask, um, I have a, a, an email list called Reaching Readers, and if I ask my readers a question, for instance, do you think uh, you know, such and such subject is of general interest or of interest to you, um, they will tell me. And it can help me refine what I write about a little bit better, ultimately getting a better product. So um, I think that it's a very valuable avenue to uh, uh, learn something about what you're doing and to really find people who might be interested in you. Mm -hmm. um, this isn't new, really. It's been around for a little while, but I find it really useful when I'm trying to tell the story of a community. Um, I use SPSS, so it's a statistical package, and it mm -hmm. allows you to create your own databases and build on them so you can start with the town's tax list and then just keep building from there, family history, church membership, uh, the, everything, everything, and it creates a type of um, uh, uh, um, broader scale um, view of a village that then allows you to interpret actions and things that are, are happening in the village. So actually, unfortunately, uh, it used to belong, I think, to IBM, and they sold it to someone else, or IBM bought it, and it's now it's now very difficult. It's very expensive it's to get crazy. access to it if you don't have an institutional mm -hmm. membership, mm -hmm. but it's never, I'm sure something will take its place. It's a really useful package. Richard, did you have anything you wanted to uh, add? I'm, I'm a social media phobe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, really, I mean, I I have I set up a Facebook account um, when I came out with Embattled Farmers, uh, and my niece taught me how to how to set up a personal account and a uh, an Embattled Farmers account and and to to try to work back and forth. That lasted for about a week and a half. Uh -huh. Um, and I've never been back on the site since. Uh, <laughs> uh, I need to learn this. I need to learn how to do this um, in, a, in, a, in a way. But I, I, I have no use for it other, otherwise. 
and and I I'm, I have no interest in in uh, knowing the intimate details of my friends' lives, and so I stay away from it. Um, but it's uh, well. Yeah, then you don't wait. Like the great thing is, you have like three hours of your day. That's <laughs> yeah. amazing. I want those three hours. Uh, so I need to learn. Yeah, I, I wanted to mention off what Kevin said that that one of the interesting things that's happening with some of the new types of media um, is that the role of some of the gatekeepers is is no longer there the way the way it used to be. That, that you know, Kevin could have said, "Oh, I was rejected from this PhD program. Obviously, I can't." You know, I'm no longer allowed to weigh in on historical subjects. Uh, and instead, he started blogging. And, and in many ways, I'm sure he's reaching far more people uh, than the people who are admitted to that PhD program. Um, and it, but at the same time, there's this you know question with well, as we know, there's a lot of stuff out there that is not high quality, um, and and so it it raises it raises questions and concerns. But certainly. Uh, there are new opportunities that are that are created. I wanted to to share uh, before we ran out of time an example of rule breaking in history um, that that in some ways is is somewhat timely with with current events. It was not timely with current events, perhaps when it was written. Uh, this is from a, a newer book by John Lewis Gaddis uh, called "The Cold War: A New History." Um, and he does something somewhat unusual in this. I'll, I'll read a few brief sections from it. Um, he's talking about the, the Korean War. Um, and he says, on December 2nd, acting under the authority Truman had delegated, MacArthur ordered the United States Air Force to drop five Hiroshima-sized atomic bombs on Chinese columns advancing down the Korean Peninsula. Although not as effective as they had been against Japanese cities at the end of World War II, the resulting blasts and firestorms did stop the offensive. Some 150,000 Chinese troops were killed in the attacks, along with an unknown number of American and South Korean prisoners of war. NATO allies were quick to condemn MacArthur's action, which he had taken without consulting them. And only an American veto prevented the United States Security Council from immediately reversing the body's decision made six months earlier to authorize military action in defense of South Korea. Um, he, he goes on along these lines um, and, and then talks about the falling apart of the NATO alliance um, and then says, not however, before mushroom clouds were reported over the West German cities of Frankfurt and Hamburg. And so, to paraphrase Kurt Vonnegut, it might have gone, but it didn't. Um, and, and I remember reading through this, um, and, and I reached that point. And I, I've taught the Korean War for quite a number of years. Um, and, and I'm pretty sure we decided not to drop any nuclear weapons in that conflict. And that was actually a major deal of what was being debated at the time. Um, but he he keeps going for about three paragraphs mm. before he reels it in and says, "Just kidding, that didn't really happen." Um, and and it's interesting because he's breaking a rule. Mm -hmm. He's checking to see if you're actually awake while you're reading this. <laughs> I, I sometimes warn my students, "You better be careful. I may start lying to you if you're not paying attention." Um, <laughs> But he reminds us of something, which is that part of what's interesting, part of what's exciting about history is that the people who are living it actually <laughs> don't know what's going to happen. They don't know whether or not atomic or hydrogen bombs are suddenly going to start exploding over the Korean Peninsula. Uh, and as we know, this is not just history. This is also what we're living through at the moment. Um, but I think history writing at its, at its best, and regardless of, of the historical fiction or the fictional aspects, uh, brings us back to these moments, helps us to experience them as much as possible as the people living through them experience them, and, and helps people to realize that there are real choices that real people are making and that sometimes those real choices have enormous consequences uh, for, for the future direction of, of the planet or, or humanity or other things. 
Um, so I, I wanted to just mention one super quick thing uh, for those of you who are interested in history writing and in local history. Um, in April, uh, there will be an event at Neshoba Regional High School. I believe it's Thursday, April 5th at 7 p.m. is the current date. Uh, Lisa Brooks, who is a professor at Amherst College, uh, is going to be speaking on her new book. Uh, I believe the title is Our Beloved Kin. Uh, but she will be looking at the at King Philip's War and in part the Mary Rowlandson story uh, through the lens of some of the Native Americans who surrounded her. Uh, and Lisa Brooks herself is Western Abenaki. And so it brings a really interesting perspective on that. Uh, but we are out of time. Uh, I want to thank all of you for coming. Uh, I want to thank Seven Bridge for hosting this. It does provide a community for writers. Part of what we, we've heard is that writers need community uh, to help them with their work. Uh, and I'm sure the authors uh, will continue to be available. They have some of their books here. Uh, but if you have individual questions uh, that you want to keep on with. Uh, but thank you once again for coming.